My name is Sean McDonald, and I'm a teaching professor, associate professor at the, uh, in the program on the environment at the University of Washington. I want to thank you all for joining us for this virtual Amplify event. Uh, first, let me begin by acknowledging that the Seattle campus and buildings of the University of Washington are on the land of the Coast Salish peoples, land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands in the Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. I am thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to be here today and be your moderator, um, especially because SciComm is near and dear to my heart. And uh, I have really enjoyed these Amplify events. I've been to many of them as an attendee, as an audience member. Uh, for those of you who are joining us for the first time, Amplify is a series of conversations we hold at the College of the Environment that focuses on issues around sharing science with society. One of the goals of Amplify um, and the science communication program broadly at the College of the Environment is to share with you thoughts and ideas about how we can best connect with people outside of academia. So our work has an even greater impact on the world. Before I introduce today's topic and our special guest, uh, there are a couple of housekeep item, uh, housekeeping items I'd like to share. First, we are recording this discussion and we'll make it available on the college's YouTube channel shortly. Second, if you have questions for our guest, Faith Kearns, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom and we will get to as many of those questions as we can. So without further ado, it's time to get on with the show. I am very, very excited today to uh, be joined by Faith Kearns. Faith is a scientist and science communication practitioner who focuses on water, wildfire, and climate in the Western US. Uh, we will talk with her today about the elements of human relationships and communication that are critical to science. Faith is published in New Republic on being, bay nature, and more. She has been working in the science communication field for more than 25 years, starting with the Ecological Society of America and going on to serve as an AAAS Science and Policy Fellow at the US Department of State. She has also managed a wildfire research and outreach center at the UC Berkeley campus and it has helped connect science and policy advocacy efforts at the Pew Charitable Trust. She currently works with the California Institute for Water Resources. Importantly, to today's conversation in particular, Faith has recently published a book entitled Getting to the Heart of Science Communication, A Guide to Effective Engagement. I have a copy and I love it. Um, this book, uh, really, um, really looking forward to sharing this conversation with her today and talking about it. Lastly, she holds an undergraduate degree in environmental science and a doctorate in environmental science policy and management. So. Welcome, Faith Kearns. If we were in a room together, there would be an uproarious applause, lots of people shouting, Faith, Faith, but it's just me. So I will just say welcome on behalf of the UW College of the Environment. Thank you so much for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much, Sean. Um, and, and thank you to John uh, for organizing this conversation. Um, and I know all the sort of behind the scenes efforts that also go into organize, organizing these kinds of events. So thank you to everyone who, who has made this happen today. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, thanks to everyone behind the scenes. It's very <laughs> important. Um, well, I think we should probably just go ahead and get started. Um, maybe you could just start us off by telling us a little bit about, um, about yourself and about what a day in the life of Faith Currents is like, especially as it pertains to science communication. Yeah, so, um, you know, as you already mentioned, I'm a scientist, science communication practitioner. Um, I focus on, on sort of a, a set of Western water, fire, climate change, intersectional issues. Um, and in terms of my day, um, I, I'll start by saying that, you know, in the book, I, I really tried to delineate the work of what it means to be a science communication practitioner. So someone who really does this work every day on a practical level um, and sort of how that can be quite different, I think, from the work 
done by folks that have maybe other primary responsibilities, right? So people who occasionally talk to a reporter or things like that uh, versus the day of a, a workaday science communication practitioner. And so for me, um, science communication is probably 80% of my, my work. Um, and I pretty much start by waking up and reading things. Um, so I, I read the news, I, I read work by uh, other researchers, um, work by practitioners um, in the fields I cover. And, um, and then I try to kind of sort that out into things that I might put on social media for my institution. Um, and, you know, that in includes multiple kinds of social media accounts, um, as well as for my own sort of personal social media accounts. And uh, to be honest, that that can take anywhere between one and three hours of my day, depending on what's happening in the world and, and happening in the news. And that's, that's part of why I, um, you know, I think I, I argue that this work is is full time at this point. It's not something to be done so much on the side by folks. Um, um, and then I sort of get started with the rest of my day. Um, although, again, I have to check back in with social media several times throughout the day. Uh, that's just the reality of things. Um, but I try to focus a bit more later in the day. Um, on things like writing about research that's coming out of my own um, institution related institutions in the University of California system. Um, planning and executing a podcast uh, water called Water Talk that I host with my colleagues uh, Malika Noko and Sam Sandoval, updating our websites, um, engaging in conversations and events like this one, which at this point I do probably two or three times a week, um, depending on what's happening again in the world, I might talk to a journalist either on background or um, for a quote, like it just, you know, yesterday there was a, a big study that came out about mega drought in the Western US. So I talked to a reporter from the Washington Post this morning. Um, and then I also try to find time to sort of do my own writing about things that are on my mind. Um, and, and then like collaborative projects with colleagues um, on things like disaster preparedness, uh, we recently had a report, uh, did a report on how wildfires are impacting, directly impacting water infrastructure. Um, and then, of course, there's just this sort of administrative tasks of every job, right, like meetings, hiring committees, um, collaborative work groups, all that good stuff. And I would just say, you know, all in all, I really fight to kind of try to keep a good portion of my day focused on creative work. Um, and that's probably a fight we all have is to actually do the, the substance of our work <laughs> instead of get taken over by email and all of that kind of stuff. Um, but it just wouldn't get done if I didn't try to consistently fight for the time to do it. Yeah, well, that's fascinating. I, I didn't realize you spent quite so much time um, organizing materials for your social media platforms. And that's, that strikes me as being, as someone who has an interest in social media um, through the coursework that I teach, um, it, it's a it's a very the social media platforms are very different. It's a very different way to communicate. Um, and and I'm sort of wondering how you switch gears between those various platforms. I mean, it, writing material for different social media platforms can be a very different experience than other types of of science communication. Yeah, I mean, it, it is very challenging and people are often surprised by the amount of time that it takes um, other than the people who also have to do it because it really is such a, um, it, it takes an incredible amount of work to decide to to read through things, decide what rises to the level of needing to sort of tweet about it or put it on Instagram, deciding sort of which of those platforms is most useful. And then, you know, especially with a visual medium, like, um, I mean, increasingly over the past many years, Twitter has become quite a visual medium as well. Um, but particularly Instagram obviously is very, uh, very image heavy. And so having to actually design, <laughs> design those images and all of that kind of stuff. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm somebody who I enjoy that kind of work and have been doing it most of my life. So I'm, you know, I'm sort of lucky in that way. But yeah, it's switching between them is, um, it's really hard to just stay, stay focused, you know, and constantly be trying to check in on comments and um, retweets and, you know, just all of that stuff. It's, it's, it's intense. And I haven't even gotten into things like TikTok or any of that. I'm not sure that I will because I don't. Um, have the bandwidth. I'm only one person and I don't have anyone working with me. Um, so <laughs> you have to pick and choose a little bit. No, no, I can totally understand that. And it strikes me too, you, you mentioned your, your work as a science communication practitioner. Uh, and, it, and it seems like it's so much more than just communicating about science in sort of a narrowly defined way. I mean, as you were saying, you're, you have to design 
visuals for these these uh, things. So can you maybe speak a little bit to sort of like the, the spectrum of skills that you find that you need in order to be an effective communicator in this regard? Yeah, I mean, I'm hesitant to, to define a, a universal effectiveness, but, you know, the, the set of things that I utilize daily are things that I have been doing since I was about 17 years old um, when I first started working in communications, actually. So a lot of graphic design work um, and, you know, that's. I mean, graphic design work has gotten easier over the last 30 years, um, thankfully. So, um, you know, things like having to just basically, you know, edit images, but also create a lot of original documents, whether it's something like a newsletter, which is increasingly in an online format, um, uh, you know, needing to um, be able to write text being able to uh, make everything look nice, you know, just the, lay the layout skills, um, being able to quickly read through massive, massive amounts of information. Um, the, the amount of stuff I read in a day, I, I, I don't even know. It would be very interesting to document at some point. So just being able to really quickly decide you know, what's important, contextualize it um, for who your followers are is another huge skill set and one that I think took a little longer. Um, you know, that takes subject matter expertise, right? And so that's where um, it's, it's a really interesting time in science communication because I think in the, in the past, there, there would be a lot of folks who were sort of more media or marketing trained who would sort of be doing science communication work, but not necessarily have the subject matter expertise, um, but they might have a different skill set. And I, I find having, having that spectrum of skill sets is actually really valuable to being a, a sort of 21st century science communicator. Yeah, no, that, that is that is really fascinating to think about. And I'm imagining that some of some of our audience here today, and I know many of my students um, are keenly interested in science communication. So the idea of being someone who specializes as a practitioner of science communication is, is very appealing. So it's good to sort of think about the skills uh, that, are, that are valuable in that um, in that context. And, and I also think it's really useful to think about, as you pointed out, um, differentiating within your book and within this conversation, sort of someone speaking about their science as a scientist versus someone who's, whose role it is to, uh, to be a science communicator. And, and, and that I think is really valuable too. So I, I guess maybe next question I have for you is, is sort of at what point did science communication really sort of spark your interest and, and it become something that you valued to the point where you wanted it to be a central portion of your career? Yeah, so I, I have been doing this so long um, that I, I actually started before science communication was called science communication. So um, I, I started doing communications work first. I was very lucky in that um, I landed in a work study job that was a really great one for me. I worked in the athletics department of my undergrad university as uh, in the communications and marketing department. And so I just basically um, jumped right in and sort of learned by doing. And so I've actually been doing that kind of communications work for longer than I've been a scientist. Um, and at the same time, I was majoring in environmental science and geology. <laughs> and, um, you know, this pairing made no sense to anyone at the time, uh, including myself, but I just really liked both. And that was kind of what I was doing. Um, and, and then again, I was very lucky because my senior year, my uh, one of my professors just happened to hand me a, an old Telnet email printout um, that had a, a listing for an internship with the Public Affairs Office at the Ecological Society of America, um, which luckily paid very modestly, but it did um, and allowed me to kind of apply for that job and I ended up getting it. Um, and, and believe it or not, at the time, I had no idea what ESA was. Um, I was a 22 year old living in Northern Arizona, <laughs> you know? um, but uh, I got the position and um, I was lucky enough to actually turn that three month internship into a full time job with ESA um, doing what we would now call science communication um, for a couple of years. And then I ended up, um, you know, it's kind of interesting at the time I ended up kind of deciding I needed to go get a doctorate because I, I saw the way that people interacted with me as someone with a bachelor's degree. Um, I was working with a lot of scientists and the, the sort of level of um, 
respect, I guess, offered didn't feel, <laughs> didn't feel great. And, and it just sort of felt like, okay, I got to go figure out what, what all this research and science is about. Right. So um, I ended up going to, to Berkeley for my doctorate and um, I still couldn't let go of the communications work. I would do websites for my labs and stuff like that. You know, I was always designing posters and, and presentations and just anything I could do that was creative, I would do. And then I got, um, I, I was able to hook up with a, a cooperative extension professor named Dr. Maggie Kelly. Um, and I realized that was like another interesting place where I could do um, sort of participatory or engaged science communication work. And I think that's where I sort of really hit my stride was, um, you know, the kind of, of uh, engaged science communication work that's done within the cooperative extension system, where you're doing workshops and you're, you know, out meeting with people and talking to them about what their needs are and all of that kind of stuff really kind of um, set me down the path that I'm on now of being sort of a science communicator and community engaged science communication practitioner. And I think that's, you know, that's, that's just a different way of thinking about science communication than what I think the normative conversation has been like for most of my career. Um, and so I've spent the past like 10 or 15 years essentially trying to outline how what I do every day um, feels so different than what the, the conversation about science communication has been. Even though I'm clearly a science communicator, I just didn't see myself reflected in, in those conversations. And so that's, that's kind of where the book came from. Yeah, no, that's great. Well, first thing, before I move on to the next question, I, uh, you, you mentioned that, that you went in and you got your, your doctorate because you didn't like the way that, that uh, those interactions were occurring. Do you think that's changed? Do you think the landscape around science communication has changed? Not hugely, no. Um, I think um, I... No, <laughs> I would, I would, I would say not. I mean, I think there's a hierarchy within academia, right? There just is, and um, and for reasons we can get into a little bit later. I think the the workforce of science communicators is is um, increasingly a lot of women, um, folks who are marginalized by lots of identities. Um, you know, race, gender, sexuality, all sorts of things like that. And, and we are often precariously employed, right? I'm, I'm not on the tenure track. I have an academic appointment, but it's a two-year renewable appointment that's been renewed for 10 years, but still there's, you know, this sense that um, I still have to get renewed every two years, yeah, right? I have no yeah. job security. And so, um, you know, that, that just to me kind of changes how we think of what science communication work yeah. really looks like and who's actually doing it. Yeah. I, I want to come back to that. Definitely mm -hmm. want to come back to that. I think it's really important. Something else though that you said, uh, you mentioned sort of like the changing, I guess, perspective on what science communication is. And, and I, I guess from my own perspective, you know, as, as a, someone who is at one point a naive student um, maybe I was more naive than most students, quite honestly, but I, I thought, oh, I'm going to do my science, I'm going to do my research, and then, you know, maybe it'll be cool, and a journalist uh, will want to speak with me about it, and I'll have a chance to talk about my work, or maybe it'll go even further, it might have some policy implications, so I might be able to speak to a policymaker. Um, I, I would like to know, though, a little bit more about how you see science communication being different than just talking to journalists and policymakers. Sure. Yeah. So I think, you know, for me, this is one of the places where I really sort of started to feel like this myth, misfit toy um, on, on the sort of island of what began to be called science communication somewhere around the year 2000. Um, I knew I was a science communicator, right? Um, and yet my experience was just really far from the way that it was being talked about. And um, in many ways, it seemed really elitist um, and sort of limited and limiting to me. Um, it, it felt like so much of the conversation was really just about how to get like an Ivy League te tenured faculty member into the New York Times, right? Or to be able to give congressional testimony or whatever. And, um, and that was not what I was doing at all, even though I was a scientist communicator. And so, I mean, I, I feel like I've had to spend the last couple of decades really trying to sort of fight to put forward what I would call a, a parallel vision, because I don't, that, that, that piece of work that's, you know, just the, the sort of um, doing interviews and, and talking to policymakers and stuff that will continue. That's a, that's a need. Um, it's a thing that, that, um, that has to happen that I, that I do as well. Uh, but I, I don't think of it 
as a large portion of my job, right? It's it's maybe top five or ten percent of what I do, um, uh, yeah, at the most. And so, you know, I I think what I've been trying to argue for is is that there actually is already a sort of existing bottom up infrastructure um, of science communication that we've overlooked for a long time. Things like the cooperative extension system uh, in the United States, um, and and so that that is sort of um, to distinguish it from what I view as a much more top-down science communication practice um, that, um, you know, the, the difference to me has a lot to do with just the, the daily interactions. There's not a lot of prestige per se in the daily work of science communication. Um, and, and I think we actually are doing a disservice probably to students and trainees to think that this work is probably more glamorous than it actually is. It's, it's, um, it's work like anything else, right? And so if we can take that seriously, then we can start somewhere. So I, I put a really big emphasis on this sort of updated toolkit um, for science communicators that really became much more about like starting with relating with people, thinking about listening, thinking about working with conflict because it's sort of an inevitable part of relationship um, and thinking about things like understanding trauma just because so much of the work I do is disaster related. Um, and I think we're just seeing it uh, more and more with, with obviously with COVID, with climate change, with all sorts of things, people are um, having pretty um, challenging situations. So, and, and I try to think about all of that with an eye toward justice and taking care of ourselves and other people as we go. And so to me, that's, um, that's just a very different thing than thinking about how to message or frame or all of that sort of more performance oriented part of science communication. It's all about learning how to talk, <laughs> you know, instead of learning how to listen. Yeah, yeah, no, no, that's that's really interesting. You you mentioned the cooperative extension. Uh, maybe you could say a little bit more about that for people who, who maybe are sure. tuning in or are less familiar with it. Yeah, sure. So the the cooperative extension system is part of the land grant system in the United States. So every state has a land grant. University California sort of has a 10, 10 system, ten campus land grant system in many ways, um, and. The idea with that land grant system was, um, you know, to basically do research that was was for and communicated back to the taxpayer. So there's there's also not some some just like every institution in this country, there's some. Um, challenges to the way that system started. Um, I'd highly suggest people read the High Country News story on the land grab system and how those university systems came to be um, and, and the land that was taken to, to create them. Um, and at the same time, I think in terms of thinking about something like science communication, the cooperative extension system offers this interesting model of work that goes well beyond applied, right? It was, it, it was set up to basically ask people, what, what do you need to know? And then to carry out that work and make sure that the results were sort of given back to the people that asked those questions. Um, there are lots of ways that that system can go wrong and there's lots of ways that system needs to be updated. But I think that's that's true of virtually every institutional setup in our country at this point. So it's, you know, to me, the, the way I've always functioned is within that context is, you know, going to a library, you know, I just gave a talk at a library on Saturday going, you know, just having these much more sort of everyday conversations with people about what's happening in our county, our region, our city, things like that. And it just, um, it's a very different kind of science communication practice. I couldn't message it even if I tried. Um, people ask me all sorts of questions. I cannot have rehearsed answers to that. You know, I have to be able to roll with the punches. I have to be able to have some emotional intelligence about what the question under the question might be, right? It's just a very different kind of, of practice. Yeah, yeah, no, that does, I mean, you're speaking of these conversations, and uh, and it's very different than say talking to a journalist or or, or uh, speaking to a policymaker, where it's it's one way transmission of information typically. And it seems like a, a really important part of that is listening, right? And, and emphasizing listening. And I'd I'd love for you to talk a little bit more about why you think listening is such an important or critical part of science communication. 
Yeah, so, um, you know, this is one of the major places where I, I started with this work because um, I had this pretty pivotal experience that I've described in my book and, and in other places where I was talking with this man who um, had just experienced a wildfire um, about, you know, what people should do uh, around wildfire. And, um, you know, he, he had expressed to me um, in words that I would describe now as essentially saying like that the scientific presentation that we had just given um, to a group of people in a Northern California town, um, what had re-traumatized them. Um, and, uh, we, you know, there wasn't really a lot of language for that at that point. This was around 2005 um, or so. And so um, it was it was really interesting because I, I ended up having to wrestle with that for a couple of years. <laughs> like what, you know, he was very emotional and he was essentially saying, we, you know, you guys came in here and riled, riled us up and actually made us feel worse about what just happened here. Um, and, and, you know, in Today, it's impossible for me to imagine having the hubris to go into a place that had just experienced a wildfire and not be um, understanding about that context that we were walking into. But that was normal at that point, right? Like the idea that you would um, somehow change what you were presenting scientifically to be sensitive to the people in the room, um, I think even today can, can still be a hard thing for people to, to really want to take on board. And so I think it, you know, for me, it just drove home how these sort of small, intimate conversations can, can, can be helpful if you're um, able to really hear what, what has, is being said. And, you know, I, and I think just reiterating some other of the points we've already made, it's like, the, so much of the science communication advice had been about sort of the communicator, right? Like it was really about you getting your message across, saying just the right thing, uh, performing it in just the right way. But my own experience was so opposite of that, that I just, I had to take that on as a topic. And so in terms of the practicalities, there, there's a whole chapter in the book that is just about listening. Um, and I talk about lots of different techniques of listening, active listening, deep listening, things like that, um, companion techniques like motivational interviewing um, and nonviolent communication, things that can be used to kind of facilitate dialogue. Um, I also include lots of uh, practical examples of how people in other professions listen. So it turns out lots of professionals actually think about listening. Uh, doctors, uh, lawyers, uh, therapists, they all actually have um, courses and, uh, you know, dedicated work to talk about how they listen better uh, as professionals. And so it, it was really interesting talking to journalists, just just people who actually have to listen for a living and have the kind of the kind of. Um, coursework or, or just practice that they did to get better at it. Um, and then I also talked to a bunch of people who are sort of leading examples of utilizing listening in a scientific um, context. And so my hope is just that people can take all of that kind of information as inspiration, just to think about the ways that listening might be important in their own work. And I, I will say that um, I also spoke quite a bit with an anthropologist named Yana Lambrinadu, who um, has done a bunch of work in Flint and other sort of lead and water instances, and is the only person I know who actually teaches listening uh, to engineers um, in an undergraduate context. And, um, you know, she was just, she, she really helped to drive home that there's a lot of ethical implications of listening as well. So I think because scientists can tend to be very extractive, right, like everything is about collecting data. And so what does it mean to, to listen ethically? And that's a whole um, sort of can of worms that I think we will have to wrestle with a lot, a lot more as, as we move forward. Yeah, that's fascinating. Actually, could you expand a little bit on ethically listening? I, I think that's something I'm, I'm just trying to wrap my mind around right yeah. now. <laughs> so I think the idea is that, right, you could, you, you could use a sort of listening process to go in and ask people about their experiences and then utilize that information in ways that are actually end up being harmful to the people who, who told you something, right? So um, I think, you know, it, th there are examples where, um, you know, having, say, listening to people who've experienced um, water contamination on a deep level, um, and then using what you've heard of their experiences to then sort of 
um, claim that they're irrational, right? Because you've asked them to describe their feelings about water and then they describe their feelings and then you could turn around and utilize that to say, oh, well, they just have a lot of strong feelings but it's not grounded in science. Um, that's just one small example, but but there have been lots of cases, I think, especially within anthropology, where sort of extracting information through a deep listening process has been used um, in ways that are unjust uh, in the end. Mm -hmm. No, that makes a lot of sense. That makes a lot of sense. I, you've, you've mentioned the word empathy a few times already, and that is something that um, I'm not sure I have heard many people discuss when talking specifically about science communication, like the idea of empathy. And so I, I'm just wondering, you know, we sometimes think about science being relatively clear, right? I mean, we, we, we come up with these results, we communicate these results, yet people sometimes don't necessarily follow the advice or follow what they've been, what, what, the science that we've shared. Can you talk a, a little bit about why that might be and, and really how scientists and researchers can bring more empathy into conversations to understand why the advice they're giving isn't necessarily followed? Yeah, um, you know, I guess I, I am just not somebody who who pays a lot of attention to the idea of sort of what the science says. Um, I, as in many ways, it, it's a phrase that doesn't really make any sense to me. Like, it, it's like, what what is the science, right? I, I don't, I truly don't know what the science is. I, and then and then in terms of what it says, it, it just seems to refer to this sort of monolithic entity <laughs> that has nothing to do with like the people who do the work or the context they do it in, um, much less any sort of, um, you know, thinking about how, how humans actually make decisions, right? So, I, you know, when it comes to empathy, I, I guess for me, I, I start from a place of just thinking that we're all the recipients of science communication, right? So just think about COVID. I mean, I think COVID is something that, you know, happened halfway through um, me writing this book and in many ways um, has made it more clear to people <laughs> like what it is that I'm talking about. Uh, it used to be a little harder to kind of explain because not everybody had experienced this. But so, I mean, I think, you know, with just with that example, we can sort of think about what works for us as the recipients of that information. Um, and, you know, I think of science communication really broadly, like just this idea of communicating with non-experts, but I always like to add the caveat that that's most of us most of the time. Even those with, those of us with scientific training are expert experts in this really narrow little slice of things, right? Like I'm trained as an, an ecologist and that does not make me an epidemiologist and doesn't necessarily even make me um, more prone to understand <laughs> to understand what's going on in that field, right? So um, I think, you know, I, it, to me, that shifts this conversation from this idea that, that we sort of have to have an empathy for a them, you know, it puts us all just kind of on equal footing in this, in this general um, soup that we're all in trying to understand sort of how to navigate really complex situations. And so, you know, that's, that's kind of the shift that I'm hoping we can make is, is just somehow being um, companions on a journey <laughs> rather than this sort of this sense that, um, yeah, I, empathy is a complicated topic. I mean, I think it, you know, it, it, it can be helpful. And then there are ways that it can be really watered down to just kind of this, like, yes, I understand. Um, and, and it's actually really hard to understand other people's experiences. Right. So um, I think the empathy comes more from just knowing that we're all, we all face the same kinds of challenges and trying to understand what the science says. Yeah. Yeah, no, I totally understand that. Well, I, maybe I'm trying to understand that. Um, so, so you mentioned that you started that it COVID occurred halfway through writing this book. Did it change the direction of the book in any way, or do you think it did make make it easier for other people to understand what where you were coming from, uh, or do you think it, it it shaped the way that you wrote this book? It did not particularly shape it. I mean, I'd already been up against so many similar issues. Um, you know, I work on water in California and um, that's about as contentious, emotional, um, 
you know, meaningful issue for people here as, as anything else. And so I think what I was able to do with COVID was just kind of weave it into this larger narrative. Um, and certainly there were some pieces of writing that I was able to reference that were um, very updated, you know, but similar themes, you know, there would be a, a, a group of women, for example, wrote about, you know, just the fact that their expertise was not being taken seriously when it came to, to COVID and that, um, you know, that, that just seamlessly wove into the chapter, <laughs> into the chapter that I had already written. So, you know, I don't think, um, for me and where I sit, I had already been immersed in this kind of stuff, you know, and so it just became yet another example. Um, and made it very, very hard to finish the book because I was also experiencing COVID just like everybody else was, you know, so yeah. trying to concentrate yeah. and focus and finish a book <laughs> at the beginning of the pandemic was really challenging. Yeah, I cannot even imagine. <laughs> I have a hard enough time getting through my day as it is. Um, well, you, you mentioned water being a contentious topic and you've mentioned conflict before and conflict is a, a topic that I find uh, fascinating as someone who is uh, conflict averse by nature. Um, and I think a lot of scientists I know are. And so to imagine uh, trying to communicate science around contentious issues where there is conflict and how to address that, 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 is, that is really beyond me. I would love for you to share a little bit more about that. Yeah, I, I appreciate the question because it's, you know, I find that there are some topics in the book people don't love to talk about and conflict is definitely one of them. Um, just because I, you know, because so many of us are conflict averse, um, I will say I also know plenty of scientists who, are, who love conflict. Um, you know, we can we can see the social media fights with the people who really get energized from being in a conflict, for example. Um, and so to me, I just think those are sort of two sides of the same coin, right? Like, Hating conflict and loving it are in many ways a thing that gives conflict all this power. And so, it, you know, I, I try to kind of argue for this more middle path with conflict, just the idea that, that we um, would in American culture in particular, probably do a lot better to just be more comfortable with conflict. And, you know, it's, it's a complex topic because I think there are some people who get placed into conflict more than others, more readily than others. And so, again, I hate to give these very generalized prescriptions, but I do find that um, within the world of science communication, we tend to treat conflict as something that can be um, defeated with information. <laughs> so that's one thing that I think right away is very easy to sort of say, like, that's just not, you know, just think about your own personal conflicts, interpersonal conflicts. It's just not how it works. It, it you know, maybe that works in a debate setting, but that's not what conflict is. Um, and so, you know, we have, I think that given the suite of issues that we're faced with, um, learning to understand that conflict actually offers a set of information. So a lot of times people are in a conflict because they're, um, there's a deep issue there. There's a deep value. There's something that's not being addressed. And when you want to just sweep it under the rug, um, I think you miss out on a lot of opportunities to understand what's actually happening and to actually address a challenge in a real profound way. So that's where I argue that just being able to sit with that conflict and see what it has to offer <laughs> when you can. You know, again, I think another caveat around conflict these days is that we're surrounded by it. And so there are just days and months sometimes. And um, if you're a person who's constantly put into a conflict situation, you know, it, there are ways to step out of that. But I would say those of us who tend to be very conflict averse and have a relative amount of power should really be stepping up <laughs> and trying to, um, you know, ready ourselves for the, the conflicts that actually need to happen. And so one of the, the stories that I like to tell, um, just as an example, is a colleague of mine at the University of Hawaii, who's a cooperative extension person who works with ranchers who are often pretty conservative. Um, we were at a, a climate change meeting and I was kind of talking about some of the things I'm talking about right now. And um, he stood up and I really, you know, just the way he stood up, I thought, oh no, you know, I'm going to, this is going to be a problematic question, but he ended up just saying like, wow, you know, I realize what you're saying is that like, 
I've avoided talking about climate change with these ranchers that I work with because I don't want to ruin the relationships that I have with them. But now I'm realizing that the even worse scenario would be that 10 years from now, they come back and say, why didn't you help us adapt? Like, why weren't you talking to us about this topic? And he's, and he realized that he sort of ethically needed to be a little bit more comfortable with the conflict and then also able to rely on the relationships that he had established with these folks that he was working with, which is, I think, one of the benefits of thinking of working um, relationally is just that you build this kind of container where conflict can happen. Yeah, yeah. So that that is really interesting to think about sort of building relationships and and how important that can be for uh, effectively communicating. And Mm -hmm. so do you do you have any advice for folks about sort of the developing those sorts of relationships when you're when you're communicating? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I'm a sort of relationship first person, and that's how I think about things. Um, And so, you know, it's it's hard for me to go back to how how I began and think about it, because now I just can't even extract the way I think about communicating without thinking about the people that I'm communicating with and how things are going to hit them. But um, the basic thesis of the book is really in a lot of ways that it's not that much, it's not so much a communication challenge that we face that it is a relationship challenge. And so thinking about it in this way where it's not us communicating to an audience, just even reframing who we're communicating with and whether we think about them as an audience, right? Like I, I try to not use that terminology because um, the audience in a colloquial way just ref- you know, sort of gives you the sense that there's a set of people just waiting to hear what you're saying. And, um, and I don't find that to be the case. I think it's, you know, I, the way I have to work, I have relationships established with the people that I work with, with community organizations, with journalists. Um, and part of that just involves many years of listening to people, um, really trying to engage with their work. I mean, it really is, um, it's just a very different kind of science communication than a sort of more transactional approach where you're like, hey, I put out a new paper. I hope somebody sees my tweet. You know, it just doesn't work like that. It's much more like, oh, um, I'm thinking, you know, journalist X writes about Y and we have a new study coming out and I will send them an email and see if they're interested in this topic um, or thinking about, you know, when we have m- more sensitive work coming out maybe about water equity issues like who is it that we're really trying to communicate with about that work um and who do we owe um owe communication to basically you know so i think it just reframe it reframes the work in a in a really interesting way that just becomes much more about the relationships than the communication yeah no that is interesting and i would imagine that 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 intersects pretty heavily with with trust too Right in, in in sort of developing those relationships where uh, trust is fairly essential. Yeah, and and trust is a complicated topic, you know, because I think um, it. it it arises in so many different ways, right? Like, so for example, I work for a large university system that is is trusted in many ways by when, many people, but is also um, n- not trusted by many other people, right? And so, so there's even a way I carry the institutional baggage of trust into a situation, right? Like people might just be like, oh, she, you know, she works for the UC, whatever, and and immediately write me off. Or it might immediately be like, okay, you know, we, we, I trust that system. And that's even before I say a word, <laughs> right? And, so, and then there's all the stuff that comes in around my own um, personal ability to, to be a trustworthy person, which is challenging, right? Because we have all these institutional constraints. And so particularly when it comes to things like listening, um, you might hear a lot of things that you want to act on and aren't capable of acting on within the within the job that you have within the institutional constraints you have, and so um, a lot of it just to me becomes much more about thinking about transparency um, and integrity than it does about um, about sort of scientific authority or or anything of that nature. So I try to operate, you know, not from a perspective of thinking I'm an objective expert, but just more that I'm somebody who's operating with transparency about, you know, who I am and and where, what my position is and what I can do. Yeah, yeah, 
Oh, thank you for that. Um, I'd like to invite folks who are joining us today for this conversation to uh, provide questions. If you have questions for Faith Currents, please go ahead and type those into the Q&A function uh, within Zoom, and we'll make sure that we get your questions asked today. And, uh, I think it'd be great to, to hear from folks in the audience. Um, so, so one of the things that you've already mentioned, Faith, that I, I find really interesting is this, this uh, idea of, um, of trauma uh, and, and especially around disasters. And you know, as someone who uh, does do a bit of work around relatively uh, contentious issues and especially more more frequently around issues of uh, climate change and disasters related to climate change, um, this idea of trauma comes up more and more. And the example that you provided earlier, I think probably for some folks who are joining us are like, oh my gosh, I, I do not want to be someone who who creates a traumatic experience or, or, or triggers someone's trauma in some way. Um, could you could you speak more about that and how we can be a little bit more sort of cognizant of, of trauma and, and make our communication a little bit more informed? Yeah, so, you know, there's a large movement, I would guess I would call it around sort of trauma informed X, Y, or Z. Um, I would probably use the terminology trauma aware a little bit more because I think we're not even at a stage where trauma informed is quite where, where we're at. Um, but I think just being aware that it's something that it that does affect quite a few people. And, you know, um, so fire is a really obvious example, but there are many others, you know, heat waves, um, floods, all sorts of things where people are experiencing incredibly traumatic events. Um, and I, and at the same time, I think a lot of science communicators, especially those who are sort of embedded locally and working on sort of local or regional issues, um, are experiencing the same traumas often. And so, you know, I think it's really important to think about both how these events are affecting other people, but also how it affects us and the way that we might be communicating with people, right? That's part of, so if you were a therapist, for example, um, and I, I talked to a lot of therapists in the book um, and Theopia Jackson, who's one of my, um, one of my heroes to be sure, she, she basically talks about this idea that, you know, if I'm a therapist working with somebody who has a trauma similar to my own, I really need to know how my own trauma is affecting me <laughs> before I even wade into sort of what's happening with somebody else, because a lot of mess can happen, you know, and, and a lot of, um, a lot of ethical lapses and all sorts of things can happen in that space. Um, but I think at a, you know, at a very basic level, I think it's just important to understand that these disasters can traumatize people. Um, I think it's important to understand that not everybody is affected by events in the same way. Right. And so, um, we may experience the exact same event and have very different reactions to it. So not labeling anybody as traumatized is really important. Um, you know, not that, you know, people may not accept that, that label or feel traumatized by the same situation. And so, um, you know, I think just, yeah, starting with that awareness that that's part of what's happening, but that there are all sorts of dimensions that have to do with cultural understanding around trauma, the language that we're using the events um, is, is really important. And there's lots of great advice in the book from actual sort of trauma therapists um, who I think offer a lot of really uh, concrete tools for working with some of this stuff. Yes, in fact, I'm, I'm working my way through that chapter right now. I find it really, <laughs> really interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, well, well, that is really useful to think about. I especially, um, what resonates with me is sort of uh, as, as a scientist thinking about also how these events would affect me or, or affect other scientists as well. Yeah. I mean, you know, many, many of the folks within our college work on issues of climate change. I speak with this with, with my wife all the time and we're not unaffected by that. Um, and so I, I really do appreciate you considering that. Um, well, we have a question from Simone. She says she really appreciates your comments today around conflict and trust. Thinking about the hierarchy in academia and academia adjacent institutions, do you have any advice on ways to work on with your colleagues to get them to value a broader range of communications than just simply the first author or peer review publication? 
Yeah, I mean, that is, it's it's such a, a tough topic, right? And that's, I mean, part of what I'm trying to argue in the book is that this is actually really challenging work that takes um, practice and expertise. And, um, you know, the most that I can say that I've had I think success with, and I, and I am finding it very interesting. Like I just was in a, a meeting, a conference last week where it just, it's, it, it was almost like the entire conversation was really about science communication um, from a bunch of researchers. And, um, but it, but it was kind of becoming this circular conversation because there was nobody in the room. Um, and I wasn't actually going to assert myself in the conversation. Um, about sort of how to how to actually do what they wanted to do in a really clear way. And so, I, I mean, I just think that we need a, a culture change. Um, I also am somebody that a large part of the book, um, particularly the careers focused piece is actually arguing that we need a science communication practice training track um, that would offer practicum or clinical based training for people who want to become science communicators um, because both because lots of people want to do this work and because the job market has changed so vastly. And I think um, learning to do science communication from people who actually do science communication um, and, and treat it seriously and treat it as work is probably where we're headed. It's just a question of how soon. So I think of the equivalent of things like medical school or law school, where you know you a, a huge part of that work has to be clinical um, or practicum based. You, you cannot, you know, as, as Yana Lambrinidou again in the book said, like the idea that you would send a surgeon in who had only had coursework, you know, or had only done research to do a surgery is, is absurd and completely unethical, dangerous, horrifying. And, you know, that's an extreme example, but I think honestly, we are in a similar position around some of this communication work that you actually need people who have practiced this kind of work. And that's where I think kind of trying to elevate it within, within academia to be an actual valid um, career path is one thing. And the other thing I'll just say, Simone, is like, this isn't, this isn't the greatest answer because it, because it takes a lot of work and puts the onus on you. But the, I think when people see the results of the work, um, they definitely are like, hmm, I want that. <laughs> so, so that's kind of where, where I put a lot of energy is just in the sort of like the proof is in the pudding. Look at the, you know, the statistics that we have, the engagement that we have, all of these different things that really start to show that um, uh, focusing on science communication in a real way really, really, really elevates the work and really pays off. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's really interesting. Uh, this next question is, I think, somewhat related in sort of thinking about the work in a more, uh, I think, critical way. This is from Danielle. I'm in an MS science communications program now. I wonder if you've done any communications research or find it helpful in your work. It seems to be a growing field. Surveys about relationships between scientists and journalists or social media research, thinking about it in a, in a more structured way. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so <laughs> this is a very challenging topic for me. Um, I, so I, I do interact with some science communication researchers. Um, I thus far have not found much of the work to be useful to me on a daily basis, right? So as somebody who just does this work on a daily basis, that's how I ended up writing the book was just really like, what are the tools that I need? I mean, so much of what's in the book is just the tools I found my way to, which were much more around um, how are doctors trained, how are lawyers trained to do this direct, what you would term clinical work. And that's what I think science communication is more equivalent to now is, is this sort of applied daily work of sort of being not a medical researcher, but a medical doctor, a general practitioner, a family doctor. Um, and that that skill set is just very, very different. And so, um, you know, I, I think there are some select examples, certainly, you know, like I find what the Yale Climate Communication Center does super useful, um, you know, just in thinking about the six Americas and just starting to try to, you know, um, pull out some some really useful, interesting stuff. And, and there are studies that are helpful that science communication researchers have been super helpful around really trying to um, 
drive home the idea that this sort of deficit model, this idea that we just are giving people information is, is what's important. Um, but I, th I still think there's a huge, huge gap between <laughs> research and practice. And I don't think that's unusual. I mean, I think you, you look in any field, for example, public health and COVID right now, people are, you know, there's tons of conversations about the research versus the practice. Like, how do we roll vaccines out? Right. And that in many ways, like you can have somebody come up with a perfect plan, but public health practitioners are saying, you should have asked us, we knew that wasn't going to work. <laughs> and so I think, you know, it's, it's something that's really common, the research practice divide, and we're really early um, in, in the science communication practice field, and frankly, in the research field. So there's a lot, there's a lot that could grow. And one of the things that I think really heartens me too, is the folks that are doing hybrid um, research practice and kind of are able to like, you know, do that, that line between looking at um, who have to do the practice every day and then are sort of doing research based on the quandaries that they face. And I think that that model, um, which is again, when you see in medical schools and things like that, somebody who's both doing research and practicing as a family doctor, um, super helpful. And so I, I think there's a lot of room for growth in all of this work. Yeah, yeah, no, that's, that's really interesting. The distinction between the, the practical and the academic, I think, is something that's not lost on many of us yeah. here. Um, uh, uh, the, um, you started off our conversation today talking about sort of the, um, in some ways, the tenuous position of people who do this work, who are practitioners. I, I'd love for you, you know, with, this, with the limited time that we have left, to kind of expand on that, because I think it is important. Yeah, so my, my basic thesis that I put forward in the book is that a lot of the science communication sort of methods that, that were out there and the practice that was out there was really um, with this idea that you were essentially a tenure prote protected faculty member who um, whose primary job was sort of to do research and then you would occasionally talk to a reporter or a senator or something, right? Um, that's just a very, very different thing than what I see actually happening, which is that a lot of the sort of workaday science communication is actually falling to people who are um, in various kinds of precarious positions, including volunteer positions. So I hear from a lot of younger people in particular that a lot of their um, entree to science communication work is actually free volunteer work. And then you'd couple that with sort of the, the very contentious emotional nature of a lot of these topics. Um, with no um, job security, um, and and you you just are you know and and a lot of people who have lots of sort of marginalized identities um, within the sciences, and and to me it's a little bit of a recipe for disaster that that we're facing right now. So I think you know one of the things that I've been in addition to thinking about trying to train people in a in a practicum based way is also that you know how institutions can can sort of protect um, science communicators and again I think that's something we can draw from other people um, there's a lot of work particularly in a university setting around that um, but I think it gets it gets more and more complicated when you get outside the university system to even think about what a sort of equivalent of a academic freedom or something of that nature might really look like so I um, yeah, I, again, I think we're just at the beginning of thinking what a lot of this work looks like. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I think I think you're absolutely right. I think you're absolutely right. Well, uh, here's a question from Mark, which I find really interesting sort of this point in our conversation. He says, thanks, Faith, for sharing your insights today. Uh, I'm teaching a professional development course for grad students, and I'm wondering how, where you would start out if you were going we're just getting into science communication now. Yeah, it's so funny. It's it, that's such a hard, uh, hard question for me to answer. In a lot of ways, um, people will reach out to me and ask me to, you know, talk to their their class about sort of starting in science communication. And I think in many ways, I'm not the best person to do that um, because I, in with the book, I was actually really trying to write an advanced science communication text because so much of the science communication work that's out there is focused on beginners. Um, 
and you know, I, I feel like the gap is actually much more on the sort of other of the, the mid career and later sort of side of things. Um, so, so you know, I think when it comes to beginning with science communication, um, just thinking about some of those sort of basic tools that people lay out, like um, you know, Compass has a message box, or just some of those, you know, how how to do an interview with a reporter. I mean, those are certainly trainings that I went through very early in my career that I think um, I probably have integrated in ways that I don't even know. <laughs> um, and then there's lots of just also basic sort of writing exercises, because I also do think science communication is about listening. So it's, you know, how do you think about, um, you know, having students do an assignment that might be about contextualizing uh, research, like in something like a blog post or something like that, um, or interviewing people about how a set of new scientific information affects them, or, you know, I think there's lots of things like that that, that are pretty good beginner um, techniques. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But uh, would you people much better trained to talk about that than me. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was just thinking also if we were you know, this idea of training people to be better listeners mm -hmm. and thinking about things like trauma and um, being more empathetic. Those are things that I don't necessarily I, until I read your book. I didn't even I hadn't even really thought about those as being important you know, important for uh, a science communicator. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why I'm saying, I, I think for me, I was sort of like, I do think there's a, there's a set of beginner tools maybe before you delve into what I'm talking about, <laughs> but, yeah. um, and I was really trying to write to people who already do science communication. Right. So. Yeah. 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 Um, well, um, you know, I want to be respectful of your time and it is already 501. I could keep talking uh, as you probably could gather, uh, but but I, I do want to be respectful of your time and, and of our audience here. Um, I guess one thing one thing I will ask is if you had one piece of advice that folks watching today could take away uh, that might help them to to communicate better and as part of their work, what would you suggest? Um, yeah, so I think in, in many ways, I would just, you know, um, ask, I, I'm a big fan of asking people questions, because I think no one answer applies to everybody, but I, I would just kind of, you know, end it on the same note that I end the book on, which is to ask people sort of what more is possible, right? So I know for me, science communication had begun to feel like this very stuck <laughs> field. It was very limited and limiting, uh, just even the phrase science communication. So I think um, we're hopefully in this, in this new stage of reinvigorating the field um, and being able to ask sort of what more is possible when we sort of reimagine science communication as more relational and just. And so um, that's really the question that I hope will stick with people is like, what more could we could we do here if we ima reimagine what this looks like? Great, thank you so much, Faith. I've really enjoyed our conversation today. I really appreciate you joining us. Thank you. Yeah, so, um, well, the one bit of advice that I would give folks who are on this call today is to, to read your book, because I actually found it, I, I am finding it quite uh, useful and informative. So. Thank you so much uh, for sharing your wisdom with us tonight. Um, I want to thank everyone joining us as part of the College of the Environment community. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. I hope that you leave today with a few of these new ideas that will help you in your work. Um, thank you all. And thank you, Faith. And have a very good evening. Thank you so much, Sean. Bye-bye, okay. y'all. <laughs>